So when a deviation occurs, one of the first things I recommend to a processor is take a product temperature. So as soon as you know you've got a deviation, get that internal product temperature. Hello, me folks. Welcome back to the Mifa podcast. Uh, today, um, we have Dr. Boyle back on Meatspad. It's been almost three years since uh, we, we had Dr. Boyle, my advisor, um, back when I was uh, at Kansas State University doing my, my master's and, and PhD. And uh, there was also always a topic that I wanted to touch. Um, and I think we get the opportunity today to speak about this, which is product deviation. And we'll, we'll speak here in a minute about what that is. Um, Dr. Boyle, how are you today? I'm doing good. Thank you very much for having me back. It's going to take place again, the, the CAMPA meeting, actually this week at K-State uh, on Friday. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about the program and, and what is expected. Sure. Um, the Kansas Meat Processors Association holds an annual convention every year in the state of Kansas. Formerly, their convention rotated to different cities around the state. About 11 years ago, the organization made a decision to hold their annual convention in Manhattan, Kansas, so they could so we could hold it in conjunction with our annual Midwest Meat Processing Workshop. So this Friday will be our 45th year of holding a one-day meat processing workshop at K-State so that processors who come to the workshop also have the opportunity then to attend the convention activities on Friday night, Saturday, and Sunday morning through the Kansas Meat Processors Association. And at our workshop is different from the convention in that the workshop is held by K-State. The convention is held by the Kansas Meat Processors, and they also have a tiered meats contest tied in with their convention on Saturday. But at our workshop on Friday, we try to cover a variety of topics that are of interest to meat processors. We have a lot of newer processors in the system who have bought plants recently or who have started businesses recently. So we're doing some back to basics types of topics. This year we've got, we'll be talking about cleaning and sanitation. We'll be talking about ingredients and ingredient functionality and focusing on non-traditional nitrite delivery systems since all our processors are interested in those nitrite alternatives. Every year we invite two meat processors who have been award winners at our state convention. So we have a processor talking about how he's making his award-winning snack sticks, another one about how he's making his award-winning smoked Polish sausage. We've brought in some folks from the Kansas Department of Agriculture who will be talking about industrial safety and health. They've, um, this group has done some um, focus on the Kansas meat industry in the last year. So this gives them an opportunity to share their findings uh, and what some of the new processors should be focusing on with respect to OSHA guidelines. There's also been a lot of interest in pollution control considerations for meat processors. So we've got some folks coming in to talk about pollution control. For example, um, when you're harvesting an animal, what do you do with all the waste that is generated? What are options that you have as a processor that you can, can think about? We're also going to do a demonstration on injection and tumbling, as well as USDA is considering changes to nutrition facts label, uh, labels in order to streamline, streamline them so they're more in line with what FDA is currently doing. So we'll be discussing that in the workshop as well. So it's a great opportunity at the one day processing workshop from K-State for processors to network to learn new information, and then move into the convention where they'll hear more topics, have more chances to socialize and interact with other processors in the state. Absolutely. 
Um, and, and I think, uh, I mean, I like you, you mentioned other alternatives and, and I think this is going to be a topic of today. Um, because as you said, there's new, new processors like in the community mm -hmm. and there's a lot of things to learn about, about meat processing. And I was, uh, when I first knew about, about how you go about product deviation and how you, uh, I guess, tackle this issue. I guess maybe you can start by, by, by telling us um, why is this an issue? Uh, I know, I mean, as an example, just to, to process out there that there are new, sometimes in, in our equipment, sometimes, sometimes it can fail the cooling. And we'll talk here in a minute about appendix B or what that is. And uh, in the cooling step for our production, sometimes the cooling system can fail and you're not meeting some, um, I guess either time or temperature that is given by, by USDA. Mm -hmm. And if you don't meet the, that criteria, that doesn't mean that you have to throw away the product. And I, I know we, we're talking this year a lot about sustainability. And I think I, I, like, I like this approach that, I mean, they have a lot of experience with, and maybe you can, we can have a conversation, candid kind of conversation about what, what this is and what, what can be done uh, for preventing food waste. Yes. So a product deviation occurs when someone um, doesn't meet a critical limit in their HACCP plan. And in working with deviations over the years, the most prominent deviation that I run across are cooling deviations. Occasionally, I get thermal processing deviations, but the majority of deviations are cooling deviations. So what happens typically is a processor may fail to meet stage one of cooling. Depending on the option they are picking with Appendix B, which is USDA stabilization guidelines, in our new 2021 stabilization guidelines, there's more options for processors to pick from than there had been in the past, there's more criteria to meet. So when you fail to meet stage one, that typically means you didn't cool the product fast enough going from 130 to 80 or whichever option you put, picked what that criteria for stage one will be. Sometimes processors will meet stage one and two and, and but exceed the total cooling time. So, well, They'll, they'll meet stage one, but they'll exceed stage two and take longer to cool. Um, all kinds of different variations happen. I've run into processing deviations where the data logger failed. And so now what do you do? So when a deviation occurs, one of the first things I recommend to a processor is take the product temperature. So as soon as you know you've got a deviation, get that internal product temperature. So when you visit with someone, you know that, okay, this is where it is at at this point in time. Quite often what happens is a processor will have a deviation and they'll reach out to me. If you're in another state, reach out to your state extension specialist because they can potentially work with you with your deviation so that you might be able to salvage your product or find another processing authority that you can work with. So when I get a call from a processor, usually the first thing I do is ask a, a, a lot of questions because I like to have enough background that I understand the whole scenario. How many products were produced? Not only how many pounds of product, what was the size of the product? So for example, if you call me and say, I just had a failure with 500 pounds of hams. Okay, are they bone-in hams? Or are they boneless hams? They're bone-in hams. What were the size of the hams? How many units did you have? Because are we talking about small diameter hams or large diameter hams? Because there's research out of the University of Wisconsin, for example, where they've looked at extended cooling times for stage one and stage two for um, large diameter products that are outside of what's currently in Appendix B. So there's different options that we can look at to try and 
identify what went wrong. Is there a way that we can salvage product and what do we need to do to move forward? So typical questions are how many product, kinds of products, how many units, what were the weight, what was the weight per unit, what caused the problem, what option are you using under Appendix B so that we know what we're working with in terms of options, what is the current temperature of the product, or the, what was the temperature when you first discovered the problem, what was the temperature of the cooler that the product was held in. Uh, was it an employee error? Was it an equipment error? What data do you have available? If you do have data logger data, um, I, in my mind, I'm going to ask that that be provided so that we can run some computer modeling. There's been changes between the 1999 Appendix B, the 2017 and the 2021. So right now, working with the 2021 Appendix B, if we don't have certain data and we're going to run computer modeling, USGA states that we need to run a worst case scenario. So if we have product pH, if we know what salt content is for your specific product, we can run more, uh, we can uh, base our models so they reflect more accurately your product. But if we don't have that information, then we have to run a worst case scenario model, which is maybe detrimental to the outcome of the recommendation for the product disposition. I think that, that, that brings me to the other question because sometimes maybe you can tell us about those recommendations that I, I, would, I would assume and based on what, what you told me is like re, re-cook. Uh, re, re, uh, reprocessing a doing a, a thermal processing again H how do you how do you approach the processor because sometimes I mean that, that, that can compromise the quality of the of the ultimate of the ultimate product so I'm not sure how how can you how can they balance okay you will have to recook um, how how would that impact the quality of the ham the quality of the of the sausages if this is going to be uh, a little bit drier product, or how how do you how do you approach them? Well, that's that again is a decision that goes into the mix in terms of what do we need to do to move forward. So, if we have data that we can use and we can model, and we know what your ingoing nitrite is, know what your ingoing erythorbate is. Again, it depends on uh, which option you're under with Appendix B. Are you using one of the scientific gaps? to make the basis of what do we need to know in order to model. Um, if we have to go with the worst case scenario, which is a pH of 6.2 and a salt concentration of 1%, but if salt isn't added into the formulation then we use 0%, then we can use one of the modeling programs such as Combase. So for example, there's a perfringence, clustered in perfringence predictor within Combase that can be used but if I run a model using the worst case scenario and I use a model that has a different pH salt concentration that can reflect your product, I may be able to demonstrate that you had less than one log reduction in or less than one log growth of clostridium perfringence in your product. If that's the case, then you can move forward with your product without having to recook. But if we do show more than a one log increase in clostridium perfringens growth, then the decision is, do I want to recook? And again, what are going to be the quality aspects? I have had processors make the decision that, you know what, there's not enough product for me from a financial standpoint to make the decision to recook. So I'm going to dispose of the product. I've also had processors who say, I'm going to recook and rechill and re-meet Appendix A, re-meet Appendix B and move forward. I've also had situations where we can, where I've relied on historic data in the past. So for example, there's been a data log fail, failure due to it, the battery quit working, or for some reason, the data logger failed to record the data. 
if all of the parameters are very similar in terms of how you've made the product in the past, you can demonstrate the cooler temperature was the same. You've got data on previous batches. We may be able to salvage your product by saying, you know, historically, everything went the same. We would predict that this product would have cooled in this amount of time. But that's not always the case because you may not have data for that same amount of lot size. Maybe your lot size this time was 200 pounds. All the data you had historically was for 100 pounds. We can't make that comparison then because the lot size isn't reflective of the current amount of product that would have gone into a cooler. So those are decisions processors have to make. The biggest challenge is, how, are they still in control of the product? There have been cases where a deviation occurs and it wasn't picked up, even though pre-shipment review was done, someone didn't pick up the data and note that a deviation occurred. And so if that happens, products released, now a month later, inspection comes in and said, hey, you have a deviation on this. Where's the product? What are you going to do? So again, we have to go back to, was the product safe? Can we model this? What data do you have available? If the product wasn't safe, then you may end up implementing a recall for the product just because it's no longer under your control and the pre-shipment review wasn't done um, to at, look at the data. It's easy when you're looking at numbers to say, yep, all the blanks are filled in, the numbers look good, I'm gonna go forward, but to critically evaluate the data, the timeframes to say, did I really meet the critical limits the frequency that I stated in my HACCP plan. And that's definitely another episode, my recall program. Uh, but I think I, 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 like, I like this topic and, and because this is definitely an alternative for, for folks that thought, okay, I didn't meet the critical limit in my house that I have to throw it away. Well, no, there is, at least there is an option that we can evaluate to see if the product can be salvaged Another question is, is this, so what happens, because I know in, in the state of Kansas, there's some facilities that are only state inspected. Uh, can you, can you please tell us a little bit about this? So in the state of Kansas, if a plant has a process deviation, they're going to have to address it just as similar as if they were in a USDA facility. They're going to need to contact a process authority. Maybe they have contracted with one of the companies that um, helps them with their data collection on their critical limits. There are companies out there who provide um, services that you can collect the data electronically. It goes to them. They do the pre-shipment review. There's a deviation. They work with you on the deviation. Other companies will say, you know what, I'm not going to pay for a service, I'm going to do it myself, then they need to reach out to a process authority, they need to get the documentation, or a letter from a process authority saying, yep, this would have met your critical limit, or no, this isn't going to meet the critical limit, you're going to have to decide what to do with the product. Are you going to recook the product? Are you going to dispose of the product? Is there a way to um, salvage the product through any other means. So it's going to be the same outcome regardless if you're state or federal inspection in terms of how you're going to handle a deviation and then meet the four components of a corrective action. We talk about cooking a lot, thermal processing. But can this also take place, I guess, in like after slaughter, after harvest, when we're cooling the carcasses, if something fails, at the carcass level, can do you get questions a lot from that, or only on the thermal processing step? Um, I over the years, and I've been doing this for a lot of years. I've only had, I can count less than one hand the number of instances where there has been a deviation associated with harvest. Um, 
that's not where I see the deviations. Where I typically see deviations in the process is cooling. And usually it's a, fit, a data logger failure or a failure to meet stage one of cooling. Well, I think I hope I hope that this conversation serve as a as as a vehicle for for processors because sometimes we focus a lot on production, we focus a lot of a lot on yield, a lot on meat quality, um, the pricing. But I think uh, it's I always like to get it back to to food safety because it's it's a very important pillar uh, in the production of of, of meat. Of meat, uh, meat products, and uh, and sometimes we forget we forget that we need to have a HACCP plan in place that is current and and that is uh, uh, up to date in everything. I mean, I know with Appendix B last year we had we had this convers these conversations a lot with meat processors. What's changing? What's adapting? What what's new? And uh, I don't sure if you if you want to have uh, just some final thoughts on on the importance of food safety. I mean, sometimes, again, we focus a lot on, on, on what is on a, on a daily basis, on a daily job um, in, in the production line, in the kill floor, but the food safety is very, very important. And, and I think I, I, I always try to, to balance the topics of this platform because it's super, super important. Absolutely. We can produce all the product we want, but if it's not safe to eat, then it doesn't matter how much we produce. And recalls aren't just for product we produce today or yesterday. I was just reading this morning about a recall that is going back to 2018 with products because of potential temperature abuse issues. That's an enormous amount of time. And when you think about it, how much of that product is still out there? Probably none. But what does that recall do to a company's reputation? What does it do to their brand? And what does it tell consumers about that company's emphasis and culture on food safety? So it's a reflection on the company but it's also more importantly, a reflection on people's lives. So making products safely to me, I don't care how much product you can produce. If it's not safe, then you're not producing a product that can be used. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And especially because I, I keep getting calls from people like, okay, we, we, we peel, we fabricate, and we sell some primals and back in packaging. And we're thinking about making a new facility for cooking so this is some this is another world even even in the meat meat processing world having the thermal thermal processing uh step that's adding that's adding more things more more variables that as you said i mean you, you don't we don't see a lot of deviations at the at the fresh level we see a lot of a lot of deviations and we're trying to to look at either the killing step or, a, or the cooling cooling step, so. Yeah. And um, if they're moving into a ready to eat environment, then they also have a few more things to think about, particularly with Listeria monocytogenes. Yeah, another topic. Another, another topic. topic. Well, thank you, Dr. Wolf, for your time. It's always, uh, I'm, I'm always happy to talk to you about this, and I'm sure a lot of, a lot of uh, people out there will, will listen to this podcast and, and and now they know that there's alternatives for, for product that do not meet the USDA uh, critical limit in their HACCP plan. Mm -hmm. Thank you all for your time. Uh, we'll, we'll see you back in the head soon. All right. Thank you.